Legends of Michiana, the Congregation of Holy Cross is underwritten by our title sponsor, Ernestine M. Racklin, and by the University of Notre Dame. Founded in 1842 by the Congregation of Holy Cross, the University of Notre Dame is committed to being a preeminent research university for the 21st century while maintaining excellence in undergraduate education and guided by its Catholic mission. Center for Hospice Care, Rod and Carol Ganey, St. Joseph Health System, and by the following, Alex Home Medical, Charles S. Hayes, St. Mary's College, Holy Cross College, Beacon Health System, Van Horn Jewelers, Holy Cross Village, McDonald Physical Therapy. Thank you. Let's go set up over here. It looks like about as good a place as any to uh, try to do these interviews. Do you still want me to test? I thought you were doing it. Give me yeah. a time code reading, please. You'll kind of grab people once we get the cameras set up and bring them to me. If I say Congregation of Holy Cross, what do you say? No idea. No idea. <laughs> Uh, church. It's a church. Church. <laughs> church. Religion. Blank. <laughs> I'm blank. I don't know. I've seen some commercials on TV for that. Yeah. I don't know. Nothing. <laughs> I think of Notre Dame. Uh, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Yeah, Notre Dame. I have no clue, honestly. Oh, good Lord, we're Jewish. <laughs> yeah, we're Jewish, so. University of Notre Dame founding fathers. Priesthood. <laughs> Private schools, public schools, Wilbur Street. <laughs> we walk and go jogging by Holy Cross the school, that's about all we could all yeah, we really know. Yeah, that's it. I'm actually Baptist, so like it's different from what I usually do. <laughs> it's the back door to Notre Dame. Congregation of Holy Cross. I say it's a CSC brothers and fathers and sisters. Basically, I never really paid it any attention. The Congregation of Holy Cross, of course, has deep roots here in the city of South Bend. As, as South Bend celebrates the 150th anniversary, we can look back and, and see so many things that we've shared in common. We, we started many of the parishes here, uh, some of which represented different ethnic groups as they arrived from other parts of the world. Uh, we also have been involved in education, schools connected to the parishes, then high schools, which served a broader community here. St. Joseph High School in particular was Holy Cross Priest Brothers and Sisters. And then the University of Notre Dame, St. Mary's College, and later Holy Cross College. So that's a very significant, and, and St. Joseph Hospital as well. So we have a lot of things that have been here in the community that Holy Cross has been directly connected to. The congregation has been here in many ways before South Bend was here. You know, the, that relationship goes all the way back to when this part of the country was the West, when this was the, the untamed wilds in the Northwest frontier. And uh, you had these extraordinary men and women who uh, found a place here uh, trying to uh, improve uh, uh, the lives of, uh, of the people who uh, had always lived in this region. And uh, it's amazing to see how all the different uh, kind of chapters in our city's history interacted with the work of the congregation. Uh, it's a remarkable history and it's one that goes back uh, all the way to the very beginning, in some ways uh, before the beginning of South Bend as we know it. As South Bend was incorporated in 1865, the sisters had already been here for over 20 years. 
and our ministry, especially our ministry to education, had begun. And uh, the citizens of South Bend were very much part of that collaborative ministry um, in the beginning. Our health ministry in the, as, that has grown to be St. Joseph Health System uh, began as an outgrowth of our service to, in the Civil War and again grew up as the city grew up and had health needs and so very much um, the congregation has grown to its maturity here in South Bend as the city of South Bend has grown. The congregation of Holy Cross first came to the South Bend area in the year 1842 which would have been 23 years before the beginning of the city of South Bend. So uh, Father Sorn and, and uh, seven brothers arrived here um, and uh, in those 23 years before the city became established, uh, much was done. One of the requirements for the establishment of the property is that they had to establish a novitiate, so that was completed, as well as um, had to establish a manual training school for orphan youth, so that was completed. In addition, then uh, an uh, administration building was put in place, which today is called Old College as well as the original chapel, which was uh, replaced in the year South Bend started in 1865. So much was done before the city was actually established. The Congregation of Holy Cross originated in post-revolutionary France. Its seed was then carried across the ocean by seven disciples and landed in 1842 on the shore of St. Mary's Lake, where it sprouted a solid, still standing, three-branched family tree. Yeah, I think we're one family. Uh, we are one family of Holy Cross because Father Basil Moreau, when he founded us, founded us as one family. It really is because of decisions that were made by the Vatican in the 19th century uh, that they did not want to see uh, this one community of men and women together. Um, I think in, in many ways, Father Moreau was a man ahead of his time, uh, and so uh, the sisters became a separate congregation and the priests and brothers formed uh, their own congregation. Uh, but we're all, we, we continually talk to each other as, as one family. South Bend is really a, a very particular place for Holy Cross. It's unique because it has a, a large concentration of Holy Cross sisters, St. Mary's College, a large concentration of uh, Holy Cross priests, at Notre Dame and the five parishes uh, in South Bend that are staffed by Holy Cross priests, and a large contingent of Holy Cross brothers that staff Holy Cross College and are present uh, in many ministries throughout South Bend. So in, in lots of ways, although we're founded in, in France, South Bend, Indiana has become a major focal point for Holy Cross, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Although the sisters are present around the globe and we are on four continents in eight countries, we do have a special relationship with the city of South Bend. For me, it's sort of like talking about one's first child. This is where the sisters began. Um, we became an autonomous community in 1869. And so this was our first ministry here. And it's from here that the sisters have grown and reached out to other places in the world. So. South Bend will always be um, our first child, if you will. It's, it's our ministry. This is our mother house. This is our foundation home. For all of these years, this has also been the place where our general administration has been housed. And so it's from South Bend that the spirit of the Sisters of the Holy Cross then extends out into the world. So it's been a, a very much, uh, again, um, a relationship of uh, mutuality and collaboration but also kind of that, that this first love, first place of coming to know oneself. The Congregation of Holy Cross has quite a large impact in the city of South Bend. Um, besides the obvious of the, the colleges, the hospitals, and the uh, uh, Holy Cross Village, the services that we operate for seniors, uh, the uh, congregation also influences many other agencies and nonprofits in the area by, by providing members to serve on boards as well as volunteers that assist those agencies. Some examples of the influence of the Congregation of Holy Cross in the area would be, uh, for example, Center for the Homeless in downtown South Bend, the Forever Learning Center, which uh, provides uh, services to seniors, in particular 
uh, assisting them with uh, social activities so that the congregation uh, has broad outreach to the local community. Long ago, Native American tribes thrived along the south bend of the St. Joseph River in north central Indiana. French explorers and fur traders entered the region as early as 1679, but Europeans didn't begin settling the area until 1820. From the 1830s through the 1850s, South Bend grew based upon its river-based commerce and manufacturing. Then in 1865, South Bend received its city charter. But two decades earlier, a group of French missionaries landed a few miles north of the city to create a legacy of their own. Basil Moreau decides to send missionaries, and he was invited by Bishop Hollandier of Vincennes. Keep in mind that all of these contacts were within a French community, so that it made for easy passage for the members coming to the United States to land and be hosted by Frenchmen all along the way. But the bishop suggested that they take up the Baden territory, which he had been given by Father Baden. It was practically a square acre on what is now U.S. Highway 933, sitting off on the right side. And so they came north uh, with the help of the Quoke Willards, who had a trading post. And the next day they were shown St. Mary's Lake by uh, one of the members of the Quoke Willard family, probably Alex. And uh, they saw it, and of course, at that time when it was frozen over, it was uh, completely covered. But later, they found that in the middle of the lake, there was an island. They set up shop on the south side of the lake, and there was a log cabin. In that cabin, they had a chapel. Soren slept in one part. Uh, the brothers slept in the attic and made it through the first winter there. The 524 acres, only 10 of those were uh, cleared at all, so it was mostly woods, and the two lakes were here, obviously, at that time. Although it was in the middle of winter, November 26th of 1842, and apparently Father Soren, with everything covered deeply in snow, apparently felt there was only one lake there, and that's why he called it Notre Dame du Lac, Our Lady of the Lake, rather than of the lakes. Beloved Father, when we last dreamed of it, we were offered an excellent piece of property. This land is located in the county of St. Joseph, on the banks of the St. Joseph River. It is a delightfully quiet place, about 20 minutes from South Bend. Will you permit me, dear Father, to share with you a preoccupation which gives me no rest? Briefly, it is that Notre Dame du Lac was given to us by the bishop only on condition that we establish here a college at the earliest opportunity. As there is no other school within more than a hundred miles, this college cannot fail to succeed. Before long, it will develop on a large scale. It will be one of the most powerful means for good in this country. Two years later in 1844, we did then apply for and get a charter to establish it as the University of Notre Dame, even though in 1844, I believe there were only eight faculty members and 25 students. It was still given a very expansive, uh, inclusive uh, charter that we could offer any degrees that were common in other American universities, including uh, degrees in medicine, theology, et cetera, so that even though there was only a very small place at that time. So that's the beginning, anyway, of the uh, Congregation of Holy Cross in uh, the United States. Well, in 1841, Father Moreau founded the Mary Knights of Holy Cross. Uh, in the first group were four women sisters, and they made their first vows in 1842, 
and in 1843 they sailed across the sea to the United States and came to Notre Dame to serve in domestic and auxiliary uh, positions to serve the priests and the, the development of the school here in Indiana. Before they even came, however, Father Soren wrote to Father Moreau and he said, be sure they're prepared to begin schools. We need education, we need to develop schools in this country. So that's, that's what, uh, how we got started and how we came here. They came over uh, on the ships and uh, with violent storms and they came and then from uh, Notre Dame they realized they needed to open an old bishop because already almost from the beginning young women were wanting to join the order and the bishop uh, would not allow them to open an old bishop. So Father Soren looked around, found some property in Bertrand, Michigan, about six miles up the road from here. And so the sisters moved up there and they had a one-room school building where they lived and did the laundry and that kind of thing. Within two months, the townsfolks were saying, sisters, build this school, teach our, our daughters. Of course, there were also a lot of settlers around and Potawatomi Indian children. So within two months, the sisters had opened a school and they, were, they had begun teaching. When Father Thorne comes, two weeks after he uh, arrives here, he does send a letter back to Father Morrow telling him, asking Father Morrow to put somebody else in charge of this university he's going to found and let him just be a missionary to the Indians. And that letter is never answered. He never brings it up again. But in his chronicles, he does mention going to visit them on, on a couple of occasions, spending three or four days uh, with them, etc. He does send a couple of the brothers. The sisters start a school nearby, and some of the uh, Native American children go to that school, etc. And so we are in contact with those people until uh, about 1852, when the Diocese of, of Detroit takes over, since they are in Michigan, then they take, take over that ministry. The historical basis for, and still the common denominator today among the three societies comprising the congregations of Holy Cross, is education. Educating the, the young people is not just something the Brothers of Holy Cross do. Obviously, it's part of Morrow's vision, and so the Sisters of the Holy Cross and the Holy Cross Fathers do that. We are in a, are in a very unique situation here at Notre Dame, Indiana, because we, in fact, have a tri-campus the University of Notre Dame, St. Mary's College for Women, and Holy Cross College right here at Notre Dame, Indiana. We collaborate greatly among each other because we have the same mission, that same mission of Moreau to educate both the heart and the mind, but we do it differently. Obviously, the University of Notre Dame is a globally known research university. St. Mary's College uh, is specifically concentrated on the education of women. And Holy Cross College, we have that blend of the humanities and the pre-professional studies uh, in order to prepare people for the, for the world and for their courses. Father Moreau's vision for education was to educate the whole person, not simply academic courses, but to also help form the person uh, in Christian values as well as in knowledge. And he talked often about not only educating the mind, but educating the heart of the person. One of the challenges that we would have in our parochial schools would be to be sure that we're meeting the needs of the modern child and that we teach them that they are lovable and we respect them and give them dignity. And each one separately as a child, we look for what we can do for them as an individual. We teach them how to love God and to also uh, know how know what the sacraments are and, and the uh, church teachings and teach them to uh, respect themselves and to find out who they are as a person. But the other aspect is they also have to learn how to share and to use the gifts that they have for other people. So not to be selfish but generous uh, children who know how to use their gifts that God has given them. Very frequently we hear from our past students that we have had an impact in their lives. They're very happy with their edu the education that they have had and they say that they wouldn't even be the person they are if it hadn't been for the way they have been educated. And I still do hear from many of the students that I have taught 
in the various states where I have been. They all say that they appreciate all that we gave them as far as uh, their Catholic faith is concerned, as well as all the other subjects that they learned. Uh, Can you find yourself? I think I'm sitting over in this right here. I was always close to Father Healy. He was the pastor. <laughs> no, I think you're right here. Bill and Barb Carlson are among those who cherish their Holy Cross education and have passed it along. I think the way it affected my life is one giving me a basis uh, from which I could eventually in later life uh, realize what, what my faith is and how it plays out in my life. I think that you have to have a building, building blocks in order to hold a building up. You just don't one day say, here I am. And uh, I got some really good building blocks that gave me uh, faith structure and I stayed consistent with that and walked through life with that. I would say that the Holy Cross sisters and in Bill's case, the brothers in high school um, were very strong in the academic area, but there was also much nurturing of the heart that went on um, as well. And so we chose that, uh, having experienced it ourselves, chose that for our children as well. Ooh, Grandpa's got something special for you. Oh, yeah. you guys are here? Yeah. Holy crap. And now the Carlson's grandchildren are getting a CSC education, making for a fifth generation of the family at St. Joseph Parish. I would highly recommend to parents who are considering this type of education for their children um, to, to strongly consider it. While there is certainly a financial you know, part to it, the, what you gain in terms of your children developing from a maturity perspective, from a human dignity perspective, from looking outside of themselves into their responsibility to serve others in our community, that's something that you find in a, in, you know, a CSC education that I don't find is prevalent in the public school system. Um, so, so for me, that, that well-rounded person is what I wanted for my family, and that's where, you know, what I chose for my family, and I think that's what I got from my education. One of the ways in which we really try to bring the gospel to the broader world, in education specifically, but in other areas too, is to discern what the needs of the times are, to look at what the needs around us are, and to try to respond to those, to meet those in the ways in which we're able. That's actually how we got into healthcare as well as education originally. There was a need for nurses in the Civil War. We sent people. In education, we tend to do the same thing. We look around, we see what's going on. For instance, a Holy Cross education needn't conclude in one's youth. The Forever Learning Institute sees to that. I've worked with the uh, Forever Learning Institute since uh, 2007. I teach a history class, which was what I taught prior to coming to South Bend. I worked at our high school in uh, Niles, Illinois for 30 years. This course is for people 50 years and older. I usually have between 20 to 25 uh, seniors in my class. I think the one thing that the congregations of the Holy Cross are aware of, that you're always learning and you don't stop at one moment in your life and say, okay, I've done, I'm finished. We realize that as people age, you're learning something still every day. And that just because you know, you're know you older doesn't mean you're not into that category of learning something new. And that's why Forever Learning is perfect in the whole scheme of education for Holy Cross, because we realize that people are learning and are excited about learning. In this third stage of life, they're even more excited, where you know began, they learned because they had to take classes, and then they had to work. And now it's a chance for them to really capture and learn new things that they've always been interested in possibly, but never had the time. This past year we offered uh, over 90 different classes ranging from everything from Chinese to uh, line dancing. And uh, it's uh, a really pleasurable group to teach because they're very interested, very motivated, and uh, you don't have to give them quizzes and tests to make sure they're keeping up with it. The Sisters of the Holy Cross were sent to Father Soren's Notre Dame to perform domestic chores, but with helping the native population and new settlers arriving in the territory, the Sisters saw many other needs to be fulfilled. Probably our Sisters were teachers, mothers, nurses, confidants, um, they white noses and they tried to teach kids and 
like any children, some of those children probably didn't want to learn or work too hard. So I think it was about hard work and yet deeply rooted in faith and conviction about what they were doing. It was all about response to need. That's the story of Holy Cross from our beginnings. In 1861, six months after the Civil War began in our country, the governor of Indiana, Governor Morton, contacted Father Soren and asked to have some sisters from St. Mary's sent to a battlefield hospital in Paducah, Kentucky. The next morning, Mother Angela, who was head of the community here, and five sisters headed for Paducah, 500 mile journey. They weren't nurses. Nursing wasn't even a profession. They just wanted to help. And within another two years, half of our community of 160 sisters, 80 served in the Civil War. We served in hospitals, makeshift hospitals all over the Midwest, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Indiana. And one of the best stories tells about one of our sisters who was nursing a Confederate soldier in one of the Army hospitals. And a group of Union soldiers burst into the ward trying to take this prisoner. Well, apparently, sister stood there with her arms on her chest and said, you take him, you take me with him. In 1863, three of our women embarked on the Red Rover, the first hospital naval ship. It went up and down the Mississippi to pick up the wounded and take them to the battlefield hospitals. And those three women, according to naval history, are really the forefronters of the Naval Nurse Corps. Again, they weren't trained. They were there. The need was there. That was the beginning of the Sisters Health Care Ministry and their legacy of compassionate care, medical innovation and prudent management continues to this day at Michiana's St. Joseph Health System. Well, first of all, their legacy is well respected uh, within uh, our organization. Uh, we make sure that we pay tribute to them and make every associate aware of that history. It's in our DNA to, to do two things. Number one, to continue the ministry as appointed to us by the sisters. Uh, and second, to be ever sensitive to the name on top of the building at St. Joseph's. It's more important than my name or any other associate that has ever uh, worked for us. Uh, but it is a ministry that uh, organized within the context of a charism uh, that is uh, dedicated to the legacy left to us by the sisters. We are part of Trinity Health. Uh, Trinity Health is the fourth largest health system in the country. The Congregation of the Sisters of the Holy Cross consolidated their assets with six other orders of sisters nationally. It is still required that the sisters serve on the formal board of trustees um, at our regional health system here in Indiana and also on our national board of trustees. Uh, the theme of the Sisters of the Congregation of the Holy Cross is see a need and fill it. And from time to time, the needs of the country change and we pivot around the particular patients and those systems. We are in 21 states with 87 health systems and we're the largest uh, provider of home care visits in the country. St. Joseph's carries on that legacy regionally here in Indiana uh, by having uh, two hospitals and a rehab hospital and also 17 locations and multiple rehab ministries. Along with that, uh, the sisters have a very strong sense of financial discipline. You wouldn't still be around uh, 100, more than 100 years later if you didn't have that fiscal discipline. I miss that. Healing the sick and preparing people to live full and productive lives, these pursuits emanate from deep within the core of the Holy Cross family. But equally vital is enriching our lives by developing the local outlets that help our spirits soar. 
because the University of Notre Dame and St. Mary's and Holy Cross College but are here, this community has access to the arts, to literature, to performances, to athletic events, to uh, the whole cultural area that is associated with the university, a major university in the town. And that provides access for the people of this community to experience that, to experience culture that otherwise wouldn't be here in this city. It would be here in different ways, but not to the extent or to the level that the university brings to this community. I think the people of South Bend are blessed to have the offerings that we have here on campus. Not only do they provide educational opportunities for our students, but they are always open to the public. They provide not only uh, entertainment from this particular area, but from around the world. Uh, also, there, many of our entertainment um, and educational activities, the arts, help to collaborate very well with the other places in South Bend, places like the Morris Civic, um, the DeBartolo Center at Notre Dame, to provide a wide variety of experiences for a wide variety of ages and interests here in South Bend. Well, we try to do that in many ways. We're fortunate to be members of this community. It's a rich community. It's a diverse community. It's a vibrant community. We get so much from the community in terms of its uh, talents and its ethnic traditions and we try to give back and the wonderful thing about a university one of its great assets that it, it does attract talented people musicians and, and artists and actors and uh, we try to put on uh, great cultural attractions we are we're so fortunate to have the de Bardlow Performing Arts Center which we put intentionally at the front of the university so that it becomes a bridge between the wider community and Notre Dame so both use it I mean we did that intentionally and so that's a, an area we, we hope that um, it, it can enrich the community but also just the talents of our faculty and the talents of our students. One of the things I, I, dis I discovered especially during my uh, term of service as president of Notre Dame was that any good thing that happens here has a corresponding opportunity for collaboration in the community in South Bend. Uh, so we were involved uh, in the Morris Civic Auditorium uh, restoration project. And we've coordinated schedules between uh, Notre Dame and St. Mary's at, in South Bend. So we're trying to make sure that people feel welcome from the community on our campus. We have indoor events, we have outdoor events, we have free events, we have those that are within the price range of, of many. And we're, we're in a sense trying to allow all of this uh, wonderful bubbling energy in the arts to become a characteristic of what goes on in this community. So uh, I think we've made a lot of progress in that regard and uh, we have much to be proud of. The congregation is a very strong cultural uh, integration into the community. What perhaps uh, I tell a story is that I was attending a luncheon on the campus of Notre Dame and there were eight of us sitting around the table uh, and we had began to introduce each other to each other and all, all of a sudden they got to me and they said, and you do what? And I said, well, I'm the executive director of the Morris Performing Arts Center downtown. And they said, really, do you know how important you are? And I thought they were kidding me. And they said, no, 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 we're not kidding. This is very, very important to us. And then they added, and to the community. And I said, well, how is it important to you? And they said, well, it's important to us because we the faculty and staff that we will attract because you and us exist, that we have arts uh, on, on the campus of Notre Dame, at St. Mary's, at Holy Cross, and in the community called South Bend. The Moreau Center for the Arts houses a Laughlin Auditorium with 1,300 seats, a little theater with 350, and two art galleries. And across the street now at, at Notre Dame University, they have uh, the, the De Bartolo building, which is brand new over the last couple of years. And it is very strong in bringing the rich cultural arts into the community. And you also then have on that campus the Snipe Museum. But it goes beyond that, as I said, the influx they have into the community. And that, that also treats the surgeon that came here to work at Memorial Hospital. Because we have these things in the community, the arts in the community, the engineers, the doctors, etc., that all have come here because it's a good place to be but because of the arts that are here, the things that are here, all brought about first by the congregation.
The congregation's cultural, educational, and spiritual outreach is further extended through Ave Maria Press publications. Ave Maria Press is a 150-year-old uh, publishing ministry of the Congregation of Holy Cross. It was founded in 1865 by Father Edward Soren, who's the same priest who founded the University of Notre Dame uh, and St. Joseph's Parish here in, in South Bend. Uh, he founded Ave Maria magazine, which was the only publication of the, of the apostolate for 105 years as a way of reaching uh, American Catholic families, a largely immigrant uh, culture at the time. It came out weekly, at 16 pages in length, and featured stories and news and prayers and inspirational poems uh, and a variety of different features. It ended its publication in uh, 1970 in the wake of the, of the Second Vatican Council. Over the years, we started publishing books and pamphlets and booklets, and that's the central focus of our publishing enterprise these days. Textbooks for the Catholic high school market, what we call parish resources, sacrament preparation uh, tools, and other publications for the parishes in the country, and then general trade books, we would call them books that are, you will find in bookstores and online that deal with a variety of Catholic issues, uh, prayer, devotion, uh, theology, scripture studies. Starting with Fathers Moreau and Soren, and continuing on through each decade, the Holy Cross congregations have been blessed with many truly outstanding men and women who touched and shaped the lives of countless people in this region. One of the things that Sister Madaleva did that was so critically important for the, for the college and I think for the Catholic world more generally, and it is a very good example of looking around to see what the needs are, doing something in response to those needs if you're able, and then if there is no longer a need, then moving on to something else. Okay. And that was establishing the School of Sacred Theology, which started in 1943. This was a time in the educational world, the Catholic educational world at least, where Catholic universities were not admitting women or lay people generally, really, to graduate programs in theology. Sister Madaleva and others saw a real need for theological education at that level for women and lay people alike. And since the Catholic universities weren't admitting people into their theology programs other than men. <laughs> okay. That began in 1943 and it ran until 1970 and at that point there was no longer a need for it because the Catholic universities were admitting women and other lay people into their graduate programs. Brother uh, William Geenan is one of those special leaders of the Holy Cross Brothers who became inspired to develop a ministry for seniors. Uh, he was on a trip to Florida to recruit for one of the brothers' high schools, and by chance he had an encounter with an elderly man in uh, the Sarasota region. Uh, the conversation turned to his state in life, the man's state in life, and he said that he had experienced isolation and loneliness after the death of his wife. Um, that touched Brother Geenan, and as a result, he came to the brothers and, and asked to start a ministry to seniors in Florida. When he became provincial, which was in uh, 1994, he brought that same passion for service to seniors here to South Bend. And through his efforts and his collaboration with a number of uh, lay organizations, they developed our campus of Holy Cross Village so that today we serve over 240 individuals providing a senior lifestyle uh, compatible and in uh, cooperation with the ministry of the Brothers of Holy Cross. Well, Father Newland was a chemistry professor at the University of Notre Dame and in his research, uh, and interestingly enough, Newt Rockne was his 
a lab assistant when, he, when Newt Rockne was a student here. But Father Newland, uh, through his research that developed and invented synthetic rubber, which to this day plays a critical role in the whole development of rubber and, and that whole industry. So that brought to the university a lot of reputation in the area of, I suppose, the beginnings of major research that was done at the university that led to changing people's lives in, in a lot of ways. Father Newland was a simple, humble Holy Cross priest that worked in the lab and he ended up creating synthetic rubber that uh, changed people's lives and what is available to us in that area. There is one individual from the order who stands out in our lifetime, not only for his long list of remarkable achievements, but because he was widely respected and deeply loved by so many across faiths. It's really an interesting question. Why was Father Hesburgh so widely loved? I think because he was instinctively a great pastor. He loved people. He was very gregarious by personality. He was widely traveled. He was also a great linguist, and so he could be in other parts of the world, and even if he wasn't fluent in a language, he would begin a conversation in one fashion or another. I think one of the things I, I look to him, may, maybe most prominently, he just so embodied the spirit of Notre Dame, not simply by what he said, but how he lived and what he did. Uh, he was a person who cared about people, he was a person of faith. He was a person committed to the highest level of academic achievement. He was a priest at his heart. When Father Hesburgh walked into a room, you knew he was there. There was a presence about him, an aura about him. And not, it, it had nothing to do with ego, ego or anything of that nature. He just had a, an aura about him because of, of the way he worked with people and met with people. And it didn't make any difference whether he was talking to somebody that mowed the lawn at the university or the President of the United States. To Father Hesburgh, they were all equally important and he treated them all the same. And he, would, he was not afraid to challenge people so that they could do better. Uh, he began to envision what Notre Dame could become. One of his famous expressions was, a university is best known, all things being equal, by the level of its endowment. He knew the more resource base that we could build over time, the solider the foundation would be for the future. It's amazing that today Notre Dame is 10th largest endowment in the country and one of the largest in the world. And that began in a significant way under him. He also was able to attract outstanding leadership at the provost level, at the dean level, the vice president level. So it wasn't just one person. He knew that it took a transformative set of agents that were gonna make Notre Dame a better place. Prior to Father Hesper's time, we were a nice little college. We were called a university, but we, were, we weren't particularly uh, respected or known as a university. Father Hesper started us on that path. And he did it not just what he, with what he did at the university, but in terms of what his expectations were, but also we had the advantage of he was an international figure, so that brought a lot of reputation with it to the University of Notre Dame, and then Father Hesburgh worked diligently on bringing the people here, the faculty, and, and everything that needed to be done to turn this into the university it is today. Uh, he was a man of great vision uh, in what could be done on an individual step basis to help make the world a better place. Uh, but even though he was advisor to popes and presidents, he was first and foremost, the most important thing to him, that he was a Holy Cross priest. And he lived his life as a simple Holy Cross priest in that regard. Real estate developed by the three branches of the Holy Cross family forged the face of the community we live in today and the congregations still exert a large influence on the local economy. It started with land, farming, and brick making, and now that solid financial foundation extends well beyond Notre Dame football weekends and college graduations. Now the brick industry starts over on the property that now is Holy Cross College. That brickyard was directly above St. Joseph River. And if you go back, there's a gully in there that has a roadway that goes down to the river bank. 
So the clay was gathered on the bank of the St. Joseph River, brought up and kilned at the top of the hill, and then carted off uh, to various places, Michigan, uh, houses here in South Bend, churches here in South Bend, uh, the main building, Sacred Heart Church, Corby, Columba Hall, Washington Hall, Abaddon Hall. Many of those cream-colored brick all came from the property and was a large source of income to better the university. I think people from this area are very familiar with St. Patrick's Farm and uh, we purchased that in I believe it was like 1883 and what the we did was we established a dairy farm out there it was about I believe about 250 acres and so we had a dairy farm we had cows we had hogs and we had chickens and then crops and we had farmers come in and work the property and the sisters worked out there as well. And that food was what helped to supply uh, the food for the students at St. Mary's and the, uh, and the sisters. The purpose of farming for a religious community was to sustain its membership and also those people they serve, students, so on and so forth. So that St. Joseph Farm has its origin in the farms that were right here on campus. The farmhouse was the building that is now called Old College, and they had pigs uh, in that area as well as cows and other things. And then if you go where Holy Cross College sits, on the maps you can see the various crops that were planted in that particular area, quite a number of crops. And then eventually, uh, it was possible to take all of that away as the college continued to expand. Father Soren was a priest, but they don't mention very much about the fact that he was a farmer as well. And he came out and knew that they had to feed all these people and had no idea how much the Holy Cross order would grow. And it grew rapidly and it grew to be a very, very large organization. They grew so rapidly and fast at the campus and they had so many barns and animals it became a messy place. Uh, the water was getting polluted, it was runoff, there was slop everywhere, it stunk, and there was no place to have a school. And so he came out here and uh, 20 years after they started uh, Notre Dame, found this to be the right place to grow the food, raise the animals. To the southwest, you go over about a mile and a half, is a lake that was built when they built the overpass. And you come to the east along that wood line, and then it jogs up and down towards the end of that big long line of pine trees that you see on the left. Then you go to the foreground back there, the background, you go almost to Douglas Road, follow that wood line to Buckeye Road. Buckeye Road is the, the east side of the farm. When I think about the impact of Holy Cross on our community, the economic impact is significant, and uh, I would put it uh, upwards of uh, over a billion dollars. And when I think about it, uh, uh, how it impacts the economy, I think on, on several uh, realms. First, I think of employment, and so uh, certainly the organizations affiliated there are some of our largest employers, Notre Dame uh, in particular, our largest employer uh, in the whole region. Uh, but St. Mary's, Holy Cross, also significant employers here as well too. So, so just sort of the trade that happens with that many employees sort of in and out of this area is, is significant and, and the numbers that those uh, institutions have put together have, have far exceed a billion dollars. The economic impact spins farther than just the University of Notre Dame and, and so many of the institutions there uh, spill into our local coffers in a lot of different ways. So when I, I think of, uh, uh, from the medical side, uh, for example, the, the congregations have been very active on the medical community for many years, invested hundreds of millions of dollars to build a new medical facility that now serves about a nine county region that has almost a million people in. So it certainly is a significant driver um, of, of our local economy. When I think about employment of, of the organization, I think of, of in excess of 10,000 that, uh, that work within the institutions that, uh, that, that are there, in, in the institutions affiliates. The greater impact, though, is the, the support there, so the indirect jobs that are associated with supporting uh, those folks there, too. So I would guess that you start getting in excess of 20 to 25,000 folks when you think about the indirect spinoff of all the, uh, the different institutions here that support 
of those institutions. So it's broad, it's far-reaching, it, it covers a lot of, uh, of different buckets, but, uh, uh, but, but significant, and I can't think uh, there's not another uh, company, institution, anywhere here that has the kind of impact on our area as the, as the Holy Cross congregations do. Sure, I mean, we could count the uh, over a billion dollars of economic impact, the thousands of people who work uh, at the universities, uh, the hospitals, but really I think the economic impact is beyond measure. Uh, because what we have in our community, uh, in large part thanks to uh, so many efforts that began with the congregations, uh, is we have a community that has a diversified economy, one that was able to withstand some uh, terrible economic shocks to industry as we knew it. Uh, that really is extraordinary and uh, it's the sort of thing that I think any mayor would envy, uh, being able to have an engine growth, both spiritual but also uh, economic, uh, because of, uh, of the effects uh, of these remarkable institutions uh, in education, healthcare, and beyond that uh, we have the congregations to thank for. Try to picture what South Bend and the surrounding communities might look like today without the institutions and organizations first developed by the Holy Cross congregations. It's hard for me to imagine what the city of South Bend would look like without the congregation. It would obviously be quite different uh, if you take away the educational institutions, the, the hospital, Holy Cross Village, all the different components that the congregation has in, been involved in, it's, it's hard to think that someone else would have picked up from there and put in place similar agencies or services. So I'm sure that City of South Bend would look distinctly different. If we didn't have Holy Cross here, South Bend would look a lot different. Uh, um, it, we, the traditional Midwest towns have, uh, have struggled to reinvent themselves as industry declined, as industry moved south and, and overseas. Uh, we saw, you know, kind of a vicious cycle of, of economic uh, decline. So instead of us looking like some of those other uh, communities that have, have really struggled, uh, um, I think people look at us as a community on the rise that, that has some real opportunities, and, uh, but wouldn't be possible if we didn't have institutions like Holy Cross and its congregations and the, the economic impact that it's had. The Sisters of the Holy Cross will continue to be relevant to South Bend and, and the greater community because we're here to stay. So hopefully our presence here will continue to be that of good neighbors, good citizens, uh, that we will continue to work with the people to find out what the needs are. So we hope that we will be here for the next future of South Bend as it continues to grow, that we are very much here in the community and, and we plan on being here and moving forward with the people of South Bend. This is our home in some ways, even though we're spread throughout the world, literally throughout the world. Uh, it, 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 at least the, in the United States, this is where we came first. And so it is always a part of um, who we are and where we are. Um, again, I think being connected to this community is very important for us. Uh, being connected through our institutions, whether it's St. Joe Parish or Notre Dame or any other institution is very important to us. The Congregation of Holy Cross here at Notre Dame, Indiana is, is not in a silo or isolated. In fact, all three institutions of higher education here are very involved in the local community in South Bend and Michiana region. Uh, specifically at Holy Cross College, that means we have active partnerships with uh, the University of Notre Dame and St. Mary's, but also entities in the local area. For example, St. Joseph uh, Health Systems is a major partner with, with uh, the college in pursuing our academic purposes. Holy Cross Village is a living lab on our college for our pre-professional science and pre-med and gerontology programs. We are blessed that we have a number of men who are training to be priests and religious in Holy Cross that are seminarians. Uh, we've been blessed with that. And because of that, we will continue to be able to provide Holy Cross religious to work at our institutions, whether it be Notre Dame or our parishes in South Bend. So we expect in the future, to the, as far as we can see into the future, we're gonna have a very active, involved role in this community. We've been with South Bend through its uh, great, glorious days. We've been with South Bend in its struggles. Uh, we are here, 
uh, from the beginning and will be here um, as South Bend continues to progress. You know, it's difficult to picture South Bend without the impact of the congregations. Uh, we're a community that's on the map because of higher education, uh, because of health care, and because of the moral center to uh, everything that, that we do as a community. Uh, I think it would have been very difficult for an auto-making town like South Bend was to have survived the economic shocks of uh, the 1960s and 70s if it weren't for uh, world-class universities and colleges, uh, for a phenomenal uh, medical center, for the social services uh, provided. Uh, often uh, either by or in a relationship with the congregations. Uh, so you really can't picture a South Bend uh, without the impact of the congregations of the Holy Cross and have it be the South Bend that we know and recognize. Legends of Michiana, the Congregation of the Holy Cross is underwritten by our title sponsor, Ernestine M. Racklin and by the University of Notre Dame. Founded in 1842 by the Congregation of Holy Cross, the University of Notre Dame is committed to being a preeminent research university for the 21st century, while maintaining excellence in undergraduate education and guided by its Catholic mission. Center for Hospice Care, Rod and Carol Ganey, St. Joseph Health System, and by the following, Alex Home Medical, Charles S. Hayes, St. Mary's College, Holy Cross College, Beacon Health System, Van Horn Jewelers, Holy Cross Village, McDonald Physical Therapy. Thank you. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.